Mr. McAleenan, and I want to thank you for your willingness to testify today. Uh, uh, I'll be the last person asking you questions before we uh, recess until 3.15. I want to make sure that I understand. So if I'm in Central America, if I'm in any country other than Mexico, and I want to come to the United States illegally through our southern border, if I have a child with me, whether that child is my own or not, and I claim that child is my own, I get released after 20 days. Is that right? Well, 20 days is the maximum uh, that a family can be held. Actually, most are being held 72 hours or less, uh, either by CBP and then released by ICE or in an ICE family residential center, usually in the 8 to 12 day range. 20 days is the maximum amount of time I'll be held. Which is not be, long enough for an immigration proceeding. Then I'll be released into the United States. Correct. That could and would and should and, and indeed has resulted in a lot of bad things, right? Yes. Are children occasionally abducted and then paired with those seeking to abuse our asylum system? We have along seen a number of those kind of cases, yes. Have there been instances in which uh, people from, uh, from other countries have paid smugglers uh, a large sum of money to help them get across? They fly to Mexico or uh, in one way or another travel to Mexico from another country, uh, arrive at the U.S.-Mexico border, and they're then paired with a child, not their own, uh, a child they've never met and to whom they have no relation at the border uh, in order to manipulate our asylum system. Yes, uh, within those 1,700 fraudulent claims that I briefed in the last 10 months, there were cases like that included. Those 1,700, by the way, are just the ones that you've identified. That's correct. And uh, the fact that you've had 1,700 of them just in the last 10 months alone, uh, for those that you've identified, uh, could well indicate that the overall number is even larger than that. Certainly. It's difficult for me to conceive of any policy we could adopt that could do more, quite perversely, to promote human trafficking and child sexual exploitation than this. Would, would I be fair to reach that conclusion? I think that's a very legitimate concern. People who traffic in human beings as a routine matter, understand that there are certain signals, certain signs that might indicate to law enforcement authorities that they're engaging in human trafficking. Is that right? Yes. And they're therefore aware that if they come through a, point of, a port of entry, that they're more likely to be seen by authorities. Where does that generally push them? To, to the between ports crossing. Uh, you know, granted, we, we don't see families evading uh, apprehension for the most part. They, they are presenting uh, and then allowing that process to start. But again, we're overwhelmed in many areas of the border, in, in Rio Grande Valley, in El Paso, uh, in Ajo or Yuma, Arizona. So just think of those agents trying to process hundreds of families at the same time, try to discern those indicators of concern. They're worried about the medical situation. They're worried about a, a fraudulent presentation. They're worried about someone who might have a criminal or gang record, and then still trying to uh, move, the, move them quickly through the system to ICE. So that, that's, a, that's a lot to ask of our agents and officers. The absence of a barrier then makes it easier for people to pass undetected through a port of entry where they might be recognized. If you want to come in through Western Hidalgo County or Star County or Zapata County in Texas, where there are large areas of uncontrolled open borders without any barrier at all, uh, you'd find it easier to get through there. The right. Stay in Mexico, the Remain in Mexico program, um, tell us how that would help us offset the perverse incentives we ourselves have created through our own government policies for human trafficking. Give, it will give more and greater access to lawful immigration court proceedings without releasing people into the United States uh, indefinitely. So for those who want or need to come to the United States and have a legitimate basis for doing so, we would be more sympathetic to them. We would be in a better position to offer asylees, actual asylum, if we adopted that program. Correct. I was pleased to hear that the Remain in Mexico program is going to be extended beyond the San Isidro uh, port of entry. Uh, tell me what you expect to see in the coming months over that. Right, so it, it's, it's nascent, it's developing. Uh, we're starting it right now in San Diego, San Diego port of entry at San Isidro there, as well as San Diego sector. 
we want to extend it along the border so that we can provide that safe and lawful access that many members are, are focused on and concerned about uh, to asylum seekers who don't want to pay a smuggler, who don't want to go through the dangerous cycle, but might have a valid asylum claim. They get to go to a dedicated court docket uh, that's going to have hearings. The first hearings are going to start in 10 days uh, from, from the program just starting up uh, six or eight weeks ago. So it's going to be a much more expeditious process uh, to get an immigration court result and ideally grant asylum to those who have meritorious claims and then create a process that has integrity for those that don't. So the Remain in Mexico program helps us help actual asylees, helps us discourage human trafficking. The physical border barrier helps direct people toward lawful points of entry. And when they're directed more toward lawful ports of entry, it's easier for our authorities to detect and interfere with human trafficking. All of those are correct, Senator. And it's also a critical tool for stopping smugglers, bringing narcotics, as well as single adults trying to evade uh, apprehension. Uh, thank you, Mr. McElhinney. Uh, we really appreciate your testimony today. And thank you for your service. You're in our thoughts and prayers as you protect our country.